a huge, thunderous round of applause for Ben Fershman, please. Thank you very much. Um, so, as Mark said at the start of the conference, uh, by the end of the conference, we'll be reaching peak confusion, uh, and I'm glad to deliver on that. Um, so, who am I? Why am I here? Um, I I work for a little company called Docker, which you may have heard of. Uh, but this talk isn't really about Docker. Uh, it's more well. It's about a lot of the stuff surrounding it, but the tools I will be using in the talk, I will be using Docker because I know how Docker works. Um, it's also quite a good way of demonstrating how some of this works as well. Uh, what am I going to talk about? Um, to start off with, I'm just going to sort of wave my hands a bit and philosophize about stuff. Um, and then, in case you've fallen asleep or are confused too much, um, I'm going to show you something actually real that you can use in your code. And then I'm going to finish off by waving my hands and philosophizing a bit more. Um, so, let's start with this. What is an internet-sized computer? Um, it's a bit cryptic. That's what my talk was titled after. Um, and if I was being really lazy, I could finish this talk basically with a single word. Um, could stop there. But I'm guessing most people here are familiar with serverless. The kind of um, actually, is anyone here not familiar with serverless? Just out of interest, hands up. Okay, brilliant. Nobody. Um, but in, in you know, in, in just in case, the sort of background is the idea that you, is you write your application uh, as functions that are executed on demand when they need to be run. And for example, Amazon Lambda is the thing that's popularised this a lot. And in Amazon Lambda's case, an example might be that you upload an image to S3, and when the image is on S3, it then triggers a piece of code which will resize the image or something like that, or create a little thumbnail out of it. And the idea is that this piece of code doesn't have to be always running, and it's only run when it actually needs to be run. And as with sort of a lot of new technologies, there's this kind of ridiculous notion that serverless is going to kill off containerization, and we're all going to be writing stuff with, uh, with serverless in the future. And as Anne said in the first keynote yesterday, that's just not true. Like, te technically, it's ridiculous, because the code that these functions are need to run somewhere, you know, and you know, they need to be packaged up and distributed somehow, and it turns out containers are quite a good method of doing that. Um, but also, it's just another tool in our toolkit. And it's another thing that we're going to be able to build interesting stuff with, alongside containers and microservices and everything else. You still need containers to do serverless in the same way that you still need servers to do serverless. And there's sort of so much more to it than Amazon Lambda as well. It's part of a really interesting shift in how we're writing server-side applications, how we're writing distributed applications. Um, so instead of ending with this slide um, and walking off, I'm going to explain how serverless sort of fits into this trend. Um, go back a bit so we can sort of draw a line through history to serverless and containerization, and then hopefully uh, sort of extrapolate a bit and draw a dotted line to just sort of see where we might be going as well. And so to start doing this, we need to go back in time a bit. Not quite to the Industrial Revolution, but going back to the start of the Information Revolution, when computers were really big, and they were things that filled entire rooms. Uh, they were very long-lived, they were very hard to change, um, but this is sort of what we had back then. And then we started to get lots of smaller computers, at least in server-side stuff, we started to get a lot more small computers. They still filled entire rooms, but there were a lot more of them when they were commodity hardware, so they were a lot more flexible, and a lot cheaper and reusable. Uh, but even these servers that filled entire rooms were too hard, um, too hard to manage, and even too large as well. Uh, so we created virtual servers, which were a lot more flexible, 
and we can slice up each of these individual pieces of commodity hardware into smaller virtual servers. Um, but unless you were somebody like Google or Netflix, we still tended to sort of treat these virtual servers as if they were servers, um, just because it was the thing we were always used to. And they were still quite slow as well. You still had to be aware that they existed because they took a few minutes to boot up and a few minutes to boot down again. But then we got some really, really, really small virtual machines. And of course, this is containers. And something interesting happened with containers, where containers were so fast and efficient that you may as well wrap every process that you're running inside its own container. In some sense, they just stopped existing because you didn't have to worry that they existed anymore because they were so efficient. And because everything was inside these containers, every process was inside a container with all of the dependencies it needed, we didn't really have to worry about servers anymore because servers just became these homogenous things that run containers. If everything was inside a container, you could get away with each server just being the same. And then if we put cluster schedulers in front of these homogenous container running services, servers, our infrastructure essentially just becomes like a big process list. Like it come, becomes something which looks a little bit like an enormous computer. In the same way that you can run PS to see what processes are running on your laptop, you could run PS against your cluster and just see everything that was running on your cluster as a set of processes. And you didn't have to worry about where they were. And the kind of interesting thing about this is not really the technology that's made this possible, but looking at this from a developer's point of view, infrastructure suddenly has become a whole load more simple. And from a developer's point of view, a whole load of stuff that you have to worry about has suddenly just disappeared. You know, you didn't have to worry about, like, where is my process on a bunch of servers? Um, you just know that your process is running somewhere, somehow. And that's all you really care about. So, in summary, I suppose, what we've done is we've created infrastructure that is so simple that we can just treat it as one big computer. And what we're doing here is we're building abstractions on top of lower level stuff. So in the same way an operating system for um, a single computer, your laptop, is an abstraction on a bunch of hardware that's inside it, the stuff we're building here are abstractions on top of clusters. So essentially provide us with the same sort of abstractions that we might use on a single computer. And this is nothing new. Like, this has been done loads in the past. And, you know, this is what supercomputing is, essentially. And things like multiprogramming and Plan 9 and all of these sorts of things, where it's been done in academia forever. And if you're, you know, a professional supercomputer person, you, this is not news to you. Um, but there's one new interesting thing that we've got that actually makes it different this time around. And there's a reason why this is interesting this time around, uh, particularly for the sort of applications we're building, uh, and that's the cloud. And that's how, this is how computing is actually supplied. And this has completely changed. Because in the past, you were constrained, like in, in those rooms full of computers, you were constrained by the number of computers you had in the room. And to scale, you were constrained by the size of the room that those computers were in. Um, and this is just not the case anymore. Like, we have an essentially infinite limitless supply of compute if we want it. So this really large computer that I was trying to build a picture of earlier, what we've actually got now is an internet-sized computer. It's just a sort of process list that's on the, on the internet that is the stuff we're running, and we just don't care where it's running. We've sort of thrown away all of these constraints of anything actually physical. And this is all possible basically because 
of the popularity of, con of containerization recently. It's because we can put a piece of code inside a container and boot it up really quickly without having to depend on anything underneath it that we can just run it anywhere on the internet without really having to think. And this is sort of, this is my reckon, you know, you might, you might not agree with this and say this is ridiculous, but this is my reckon about where computing is headed. Um, this is sort of seems where the general trend is, is that we are building these abstractions on top of stuff that's on, on top of the cloud, on top of infrastructure that is in the cloud. It's making it a little bit, bit like a single computer that developers can use, and it's really simple. Uh, so why am I talking about this? Uh, what actually is serverless? Um, how does that fit into this? Uh, well, serverless is essentially a bunch of tools that let you run code on the internet. It's about treating the internet as if it was a single computer that you're just executing code on. And the reason this has appeared now is because of a whole bunch of technologies intersecting. So containers is the obvious one. Containers and cloud are the obvious ones, actually. The two things I've just talked about, where containers have become good enough and ubiquitous enough, and the cloud has become good enough and ubiquitous enough that this has become possible that, oh, we can run just a snippet of code inside a container and it runs on the cloud, so it just works. Um, and there's also a whole bunch of other interesting things that are uh, coming along at the same time as well. My colleague, Justin Cormack, has an interesting analysis um, where um, essentially this is also an economics thing, which is quite interesting, where our biggest constraint in cloud computing has been the cost of RAM. So what you're paying for in computing is essentially how much RAM you're using, because that's the thing that has to be switched on all the time, it's consuming power, and you can't share it in the same way that you can time share a CPU. Um, so we've been constrained by this, essentially how much RAM we're using for a application. Um, and the reason we kept a whole bunch of stuff in RAM is because spinning disks were really slow. Uh, but now we have SSDs, so it almost becomes practical to have our code sitting on an SSD, and when we need to run that code, we can load it straight into RAM to execute it. Um, so that's an economics thing, where SSDs have become widespread enough and cheap enough that we can keep stuff in SSDs instead of RAM, therefore we can do serverless. Um, and that's an just another sort of, another one of these things that is intersecting at this particular time that's making serverless possible. And there are probably a whole bunch of other these, these things as well that you know, could, could analyze for a long time, but this is the reason that technology has come along at a certain time, is that things are intersecting um, that make it possible. Um, but the point is, is that the more stuff is going to come along in the future and more technology is going to intersect. And there's a whole lot more that computers do than just running functions as well. Um, and if we get out of this sort of myopic view of like, oh, this really exciting new thing called serverless, and see it in context of what we're doing, we can sort of fit it into this much wider trend of how we're building distributed applications. And if you're interested in building some of this stuff as well, you want to think about where these trends are going as well, so you can figure out what we're going to need next, um, which is part of my job as well, which is why I'm interested in this stuff. Um, but before I talk about that, um, I sort of want to show you what I mean by these really big computers by actually showing you some real running code um, and stuff like that. So how do we build apps for these things? Uh, let's start with the most basic thing, probably a thing you do every day on your laptop, uh, particularly if you work at a, at a shell. And that's running a process. What does running a process involve? In a, in a traditional computer, oh, come back. In a traditional computer, it would look something like this. This is a fork exec. This is how pretty much every process on a Unix style operating system, I suppose, is run. Um, when a computer boots up, it boots up in it, which then boots up a bunch of other processes by copying itself and then replacing itself with another process. And in it might start up an SSH daemon. Um, and when you log in over SSH, it will then fork exec a bash shell. And then um, in your bash shell, when you run a command, it will then fork exec the command that you're running. And that's how 
all of the processes are run. Um, and this is quite simple. You know, it's essentially just spawning a child process. Uh, and we all sort of know how that works. Um, but if we wanted to do that in a distributed system, well, in the past, if we had sort of servers that were living around for a long time, we might think, OK, well, if I want to run a background process, I don't want it to run on the computer that I'm on at the moment, because that's only going to scale up to a certain point. So I want it to be able to run on another computer somewhere, a sort of set of pool of computers, say. Um, and my code is going to have to be on those computers somehow, so maybe I should be running my code on that, that computer somehow. Um, so, I know, let's create a bunch of worker processes. And then how do we get the work onto those worker processes? Oh, well, then we probably need some kind of message queue system to be able to pass the work to those workers. And, oh, our message queue needs to be reliable as well, so we're going to need some kind of reliable message queue system. And it's just a whole horrible ball of complexity, and I'm sure a lot of you here have got into this. We all know how to do it now, so it's not actually you know, too much of a problem, but still, you know, it's, not, it's not the same as just doing a fork exec, which is trivial. Um, but we actually have some much better tools now. And we have cluster schedulers that can run processes for us. So why do we bother with all this crap? Well, let's say, let's say we've got an API for running Docker containers, uh, which happens to be the Docker API. Um, this, is, this HTTP request is a bit like a fork exec over the network. It's saying, start this process somewhere else. Um, and all of the dependencies come along with it because you've defined the image with the environment that it needs to run in. So it doesn't need to run on the same actual computer that you've got. And the thing at the other end, the server, that this is, doesn't need to be a single computer either. It can be a cluster scheduler that can find some free resources in your infrastructure and run it there somewhere. Um, so I'm going to demo how this works, I suppose. Let's see if I can get a shell. Here we go. Did everyone see that? It's a bit high. Um, so this is a shell that is po pointing to a Docker Swarm. Uh, this happens to be the last version of Docker Swarm, not Docker 1.12. Uh, Docker 1.12 is basically better in every way, except it's missing one crucial feature, which we're working on at the moment. If you're interested, come and see me after. Really? I'm not, not going to explain. <laughs> But it's really good, so don't, don't judge it because of that. Um, now, I've got a Docker shell here, points to get a swarm, um, and I can run stuff on a cluster. So I've got a piece of code that does some work. In this case, it adds together two numbers. Um, I can pass it some input, which is two numbers. And then when I execute this, swarm is going to find some free resources on my cluster, execute this bit of code, um, and then return me the result. And that's how that works. Um, and the beauty of this is that I've just run a command as if I'm running it on my local computer, as if it was a single computer, but this is actually running on a cluster using whatever resources available. So in some sense, this scale, this is obviously a trivial example, but if this was something actually intense, this would scale as much as I wanted it to. Uh, let's take a more complicated example. So I have here the entire text of Ulysses, um, which is a lot of text, all of that sort of thing. Um, and if I pipe these files into a thing called Parallel, uh, which is essentially a tool that just runs a bunch of commands in parallel and returns the result of each command on each line, tell it to do loads of Parallel, and then pipe each of these files into a Docker command. So this could be a local command, but what I'm doing here is piping it into a Docker command so it runs on my swarm cluster. Um, and then do a word count on this. And this is, if you've done any Hadoop work, this is just the sort of, oops. This is kind of the uh, classic Hadoop example. Um, so if I run this, it's going to pipe each of these files into word count. It's going to come out in sort of clumps because it's all running in parallel. Um, and what this has done is it's spun up a separate container for each of these files to do a word count on it, run them on my swarm wherever there are free resources, and then return back all the results all at once and output them on each line. And then 
because this is just a shell, I can do some other stuff as well. Um, I can use that function I had before to then reduce these word counts down into a single number. So this add container is basically taking every line and just adding them all together. Um, so that's really simple MapReduce done on a shell, done in parallel on a cluster. And, and obviously this is a trivial example. You, know, you probably wouldn't actually want to do word counts on a cluster like this. But imagine if, I don't know, these files in here were video files. And instead, I was running FFmpeg on here to convert all of these video files. If I wanted to convert 100 video files, I could do that trivially on a cluster, and it would take just as long as the longest video file takes to convert, because it would do it all in parallel on my enormous internet-sized computer if this was a cloud-hosted swarm. Um, I think the beauty of this technique as well, and the reason why this is really exciting, is from my point of view as the developer, this is just looks like a normal computer to me. I don't have to care that this is a cluster, but it just kind of works as I expect it to work, uh, which is really cool. Um, and there's one more step we can take here as well, is what if we were doing these commands from within a programming language? So what if I was using a Docker client library to run this stuff? So I can load in a Docker client library. Start up a client here, and then essentially do the same thing that I was doing from the command line, but I'm now doing it from within a programming language, from within the applications that I'm running. And the really neat thing about this is I'm in Python, so I could run any piece of code in any language that I wanted. So let's use uh, Node.js, for example. <laughs> uh, and I can pass it input, you know, as, oops, sorry, um, as command line arguments. Um, and then this is doing exactly the same thing that I was doing on the command line, but I can now use it to run functions from within my applications. And if you've been looking at serverless, this look like, might look quite similar, quite uh, familiar, because this is kind of what serverless is. I'm packaging out my functions inside Docker containers uh, and spinning them up on demand in the cloud. Um, and to make this even better, you could pipe in and out JSON and all sorts of things like this. You could define interfaces around these, around these containers, um, so it's not just standard in and standard out, and you don't get new lines at the end of your return values. <laughs> um, so, how might we actually use this in a real application? Well, I've got a uh, real application here, and what this application is, is it's two web front-end apps. One of, the, one of them is an application that people can vote on stuff with, and they can choose between two options. And when people vote on stuff, it, push, it push, pushes it onto a message queue, um, and then a worker processes, pro process picks up that work off the message queue and does some work on it. Um, it sort of validates that the vote is correct and, and stuff like that. And then it sticks it into a database so that the results application can display the results to people who are interested. Now if we think, going back to what I was talking before about message queues, if we think about this with our um, internet sized computer hat on, um, there's actually a really obvious thing here that we can get rid of. Why do we have this message queue and worker that are sitting around running all the time when they don't need to be? We can actually just replace that with a bit of code that just does the work of processing a vote. We've now eliminated two processes that have to sit around using infrastructure with a thing that just spins up and runs when we need it. So let's take a look at the actual uh, code to see what this does. So I've got here the Flask application that does this, and you can see here there's a, when it receives a post request, what it's gonna do is get that value and then run a Docker image to actually record that vote. And it passes in, you know, it, it runs the Docker image and then passes in some values as arguments, which is the data that it needs. And then it says detach equals true, which is the same as passing the dash D flag on the Docker run command, which says run this in the background, I don't care about the result. And then the web server can return the result immediately. And this is exactly what we're doing with our message queue and worker system, except it only runs when it needs to run. Uh, so that's quite neat. 
Um, that's a whole load of infrastructure that we've eliminated from the developer's point of view, and a whole load of stuff that also from the developer's point of view, we've made it a whole load more simple. So, this is what our application looks like now. We've also got a bunch of other things here that are running for a long time that we might be able to eliminate. Um, and these are our HTTP servers. These are sort of doing similar things to our worker queue, if you think about it, and they're sitting there waiting for work, and when it gets an HTTP request, it does the work, and then stops and sits around waiting for more work to be done. What if we could replace this with things that just run on demand? Um, so if, well, actually, if you've used Lambda, you're probably familiar with this sort of technique. Um, this is what API Gateway does, where it can spin up Lambda functions just for HTTP requests. But let's take a look at how we might do this with um, Docker. And the neat thing about Docker uh, is that Docker containers are just processes. And it turns out if we, if we want to serve HTTP requests with, by just running processes, uh, this is actually a solved problem. Uh, and this was sold back in the 90s for single computers um, with a thing called CGI. Uh, and it turns out it does this job really well. Um, so what I've done in Python is I've used this standard CGI handler, which has you know, been around in Python for decades because you know, this is how we used to do websites. And at the end, instead of, um, instead of running a web server in Python, all I'm doing is just doing the CGI handler. So when I run this Python script, it will just return an HTTP response immediately and quit. Um, so that's how I've done this. Um, and we've also got the other service in this, um, in this application, uh, <laughs> which was unfortunately written in Node.js. And Node.js is such a modern language um, that it actually has no support for CGI. Uh, so I had to use a much um, better language for our uh, serverless CGI future. Uh, so I rewrote it in Perl, uh, <laughs> which works much better. Um, and uh, so essentially what that's doing is it's reading from the database that we've got running the results and showing the results. Uh, so if I get up a shell here and boost up my application, which is just two long running things now, it is just the Postgres database and a really simple entry point server that listens for HTTP requests and spins up Docker containers when it receives HTTP requests, essentially sitting there doing nothing. Um, sort of like a load balancer, if you like. And then if I open the browser and go to the application, this is the voting application, and I can open up the results application. Uh, which is displaying the results of our vote that we're doing. Cats versus dogs. And if I vote for cats, like so, we can see that cats are winning. And that is an entirely serverless application built on top of Docker. And Perl. Uh, <laughs> and what's really neat about this is we can see that it says what, um, what container the vote is being processed by. Um, and I can prove that this actually works, is every time, I, um, every time I refresh this page, it's being processed by an entirely fresh container um, that is serving up the, you know, the, the response for this HTTP request. So, that's a real application. Um, this demo is sort of a joke. Like, I'm not really suggesting that you rewrite your Node.js front end in Perl. Um, but there are some kind of practical techniques that you can use here uh, that are quite interesting. And one of those is you can package functions inside containers. So if you want to start using serverless straight away on your own infrastructure, in, you know, in your own applications, you can package functions inside containers and then run them on a swarm which will just make sure they run anywhere where there's free resources in your infrastructure. And that's a really practical thing that you can start doing right now. Um, so if you have these sort of worker queue systems, um, you can replace them with something much simpler, which is this, which, which will scale, um, you know, as long as you've got the infrastructure there, will scale uh, elastically as 
the work needs to be done. And then there was another really interesting technique as well, um, which you might be able to incorporate into applications that I find really interesting, um, is that what we're doing is we're actually running containers from containers. So that entry point server that was running HTTP, that was serving HTTP requests, that was inside a container. And then I passed it a Docker socket, which lets it run more containers. And then those containers also had a Docker socket, which let it run the background workers. Um, I think this is really interesting. It's still in its very early stage, because it's probably a bad idea. Well, it is a bad idea, passing in a complete Docker socket into your containers. Um, but we're working right now on um, a sort of really simple proxy, which will give you a tiny subset that just lets you start containers and not see anything else, which will make this technique possible. Actually, if you want to help with that as well, we're looking for help, because this is all just very sort of side projecty grassroots stuff. Um, but that's going to enable some really interesting um, sort of recursive uh, architectures that we can build with this system. Because you can deploy your application as this single container that can then spawn off more stuff onto, onto a cluster in the same way that you can start a process on a single computer and it spawns itself off into multiple processes. It's that exact same idea, but for clusters. So I suppose that gives a hint that what I'm going to talk about next, which is what is next. Like, what, what, you know, where is this leading? Um, and obviously these are just reckoned, because I don't actually know. I'm not, I can't see into the future. Um, but I've done enough of this stuff that I can sort of, you know, guess. Um, and in that past example, like, CGI didn't really work there because there is some latency to starting a container. It's very small, but if you actually care about you know, a user instantly getting an HTTP response, you probably don't want to run a whole container for each thing in the same way that you don't want in CGI to run a whole process for a CGI response. So how might we actually design this? Um, well, if we sort of escape the constraints of serverless and escape this sort of idea that oh, everything should just be functions, and instead think about our infrastructure just as a computer, we can get some, inf some inspiration from how computers used to do this. I take, for example, an Apache server. What an Apache server does um, when you boot it up is it forks off a bunch of workers to serve requests. And this didn't scale because it could only fork off uh, workers up to the size of the computer it was on. But if we've got a cluster-sized computer, we don't actually have that constraint. So that pattern that the Apache server did, and whatever language server you use as well, um, we can actually reuse that pattern um, wholesale. Like, you could imagine shipping your web front ends as a single container that you run on your cluster, and then it can spin up workers to serve requests. And as it receives more load, it can spin up more workers. And because it's a cluster, it doesn't have the constraints of just being on a single machine, so it can essentially auto-scale as much as it needs to serve that load. And when it stops receiving that load, it can auto-scale back to um, something smaller. It's essentially an auto-scaling web front end that you're shipping inside a single container, like you would ship a single binary onto a computer. With that sort of thought, what would a serverless database look like? Well, this in a sense is also a little bit ridiculous because, I mean, you could theoretically design a database which doesn't actually run but only spins up when you want to load data and stuff like that, but you're, again, suffering from constraints where you probably want to get the response of that query as quickly as possible and you don't want to have to wait for the database to load, load all, all of its data off disk and stuff like that. Um, so what could we do instead? How could we design this sort of database? Um, well, you can imagine a database that, again, you ship in a container, but then that container could look at the structure of the cluster that it's running on and figure out what sort of shape it needs to be for that cluster. So it could look at the cluster and say, oh, there are X number of nodes, I need a bunch of shards here and a bunch of replicas over here and just spin them all up. You don't have to worry about you know, managing all of the servers that your database might be because there are good enough abstractions 
that the database can just sort of figure it out itself. This obviously doesn't exist yet, but you know, it's something to think about. Um, and I suppose the line of thinking I've been using with this sort of stuff is just sort of to try and escape the complexity mindset, escape the idea that infrastructure has to be really complicated. Um, we're sort of thinking about all the time about how the applications that we're writing have to run on loads and loads and loads of computers. Um, but most of the time, and for most applications, obviously there are exceptions, but for most applications you just don't really have to think about that. In the same way that when you're writing an application for a single computer, you normally don't think about whether a piece of data is in the L1 cache or whether you know, two pieces of code are running on the same processor core so they can share the same cache. Um, you know, we just have abstractions to get that, to remove that stuff for us. Um, but though, those things are still there if, you know, you actually do care about that sort of thing. And I think part of the reason we're stuck in this kind of complexity mindset is partially there are a whole bunch of extra complexities with distributed systems, um, which you do have to be aware of. Um, but also, a lot of people sort of benefit from distributed systems uh, being very complicated as well. And um, again, a sort of callback to Anne's, Anne's talk this morning is that, not this morning, yesterday morning, um, is that we at the moment as software engineers are a whole bunch of craftsmen crafting perfected applications. Um, and we use this sort of complexity as kind of a, a badge of pride. And like I say this as an engineer because I love doing this as well. The like, engineers just love engineering stuff. Um, but it doesn't need to be like that all the time. And Docker is a great analogy for this, where for loads of time we had all of this container technology. We had all of this stuff that could make containers work, um, but only Google could use it. Um, you know, not everybody is Google. So we came along, just added a really simple interface on, on it, and then now the 99% can use it. So what we're gonna need is we're gonna need tools and design patterns um, to be able to build this stuff. Like we have, we have the foundations. Um, there are a whole lot of shoulders that we can stand on to build this technology, it's just too complicated. And what I really like doing is looking at the past for inspiration about how we're gonna build this stuff. So if you want ideas about things to build, and if you, know, if you wanna create a new startup or something, um, this is how I like thinking about this sort of thing. I like looking at stuff that's done, been done in the past and see if we can apply that model to things we've got now. And obviously the thing I've just been talking about is that we can look at how single computers do stuff. Like, are there things we can steal from single computers that we can apply to clusters? Uh, we've pretty much got packaging sorted, um, or an executable format of some kind, and that's containers. Like, we've sorted that problem. We've sort of sorted out schedulers. So on a single computer, your CPU scheduler, time shares, what processor cores you have available. We've now got, you know, Swarm, Kubernetes, and Mesos, and so on. Um, process management, same kind of thing. Storage, got loads of that as well, like people doing cloud storage and building really good abstractions for applications. Um, network interfaces, you know, <coughs> this is the thing we have on single computers, we've also got them for clusters. Interprocess communication, sort of, you know, we've got some things like that, so, so you can use network sockets and stuff. Access control, sort of, you know, we're building, building sort of enterprise products on top of, um, on top of things like Docker and Mesos, which do these sorts of things. Again, user interfaces, sort of. Um, and then there are a whole bunch, you know, a whole bunch of things like this, app stores. Um, you know, how are we going to get all this software? Um, and the thing I'm particularly interested in, uh, which is what we do a lot of Docker as well, is developer tools and IDs and stuff like that. Like, what's what's the X code for distributed applications? Um, and this is the stuff that's really going to make it possible and popular as well, because if developers can't use it, like developers who aren't, you know, incredibly good, um, which is most developers. <laughs> I imagine the fact that you're here at this sort of conference means that you're probably one of the elite few of developers who are really interested in this stuff. It turns out most people just don't care, and they just want to get their job done. Um, we're going to need really good tools to build this stuff as well. And I sort of, 
like looking back at CGI for these sorts of things, because we've got all of these radically new technologies, radical new abstractions for building stuff, and we barely scratch the surface of what we can do with them. Like just these sort of ideas I've shown today. Like there's loads of stuff like that that obviously I as one person can't can't think of. Um, and CGI is a really apt analogy for this sort of thing because like back in the 90s, CGI was incredibly exciting. Like it let you do things that weren't possible before. Like we could, like before that, web pages were just these static documents that were being served, and now you could actually interact with a web page, and submit data to something, and it showed you it back, and it showed it to the rest of the world. This was incredibly exciting. Um, but CGI was also terrible. Like it was really, really, really bad. But it enabled so many things and was compelling enough that people used it anyway. And we're at the same stage with distributed apps right now, is that all of our tooling is crap, but we use it anyway because it's so compelling. And I think this is one of the reasons why serverless is so exciting, is serverless is just a tiny, tiny bit of this new world, but it's sort of a glimpse of what we're going to be doing in the future. Um, but there's still so much to do. Um, so if you're interested in building tools, please do build them, because we're not going to be able to do it without that. Thank you. And this is just a web page with a bunch of links off to stuff, if you're interested in things like this. Um, it's Docker specific, obviously, but you know, same idea. Um, and I'm beef version everything. Uh, is there time for questions? There is. Cool, okay. I will we'll take questions. Any questions? On the left, in the middle, there. So, obviously, CDI is not the best. So, what do you think the FCDI would be for serverless? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, some, some kind of abstraction. Um, I, I think. Uh, I mean, FCGI is sort of what it described with the idea of a, you know, single service spawning off child processes. I think I think what we're going to need is you can imagine some kind of tool or some kind of abstraction which is smart enough to know when it receives an HTTP request, it will spin up something which will keep the code alive to return the response and will keep it alive long enough that if it receives another response quickly enough, it will be able to serve it back instantly and keep alive all the database connections and stuff like that. Um, uh, or indeed, similarly, something which knows how to, because we already have that already pretty much, which is language servers, you know, like a, like a Python web server which, load, which serves Python applications. You can imagine a thing sitting on top of that which is smart enough how to know how to spin those up and keep them alive, you know, or something like that. Um, uh, Amazon does a similar thing by having a slightly high level of abstraction where they actually care about what is in, what your language is and they will spin up your Python runtime and keep your Python runtime alive so it can call the function again multiple times. You know. um, that's also another possibility. But I, I think there are interesting abstractions where we don't have to actually worry about the language runtime but we can just keep something alive, you know, regardless of what's inside. Any other questions? Yes, Luke. Okay, we're going along. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. That was a really, really good talk. Um, I'm, I'm curious how you are thinking about sort of squaring the circle between uh, in, increasing simplicity for developers um, in a distributed context while still dealing with the fallacies of distributed computing. Yeah. So this is actually a slide I removed. I had the fallacies okay. of distributed computing in there, and I thought, oh, this spoils it. <laughs> Um, yes, the values of distributed computing still apply. Um, you know, the, the funny thing about uh, cluster sized computers is that you have all of these like weird effects where um, some of your processor cores might just like disappear, um, and you know, like so somebody might be manning manning in the middle the the bus between your CPU and your main memory and things like that. You know, uh, and you have to take this sort of stuff into account. Um, but what I've been trying to think through, and I don't know whether this is correct or not, but whether we can, because for a lot of use cases, we don't 
there are certain things we don't care about. You know, so sometimes it might not matter if it happens five minutes in the future. Um, it might not happen, matter if it happens twice and stuff like that. Whether we can define these constraints about how things work, like provide containers that say these have these constraints. Like it doesn't matter if this container works twice. Figure it out. And whether whether we can have those sorts of things, you know, um, maybe that's a solution. And also, also sort of understanding the constraints of um, of what the piece of code you're running is doing. Because if you're in a programming language and you read a file in Python, for example, you know that's going to block for as long as the file seek is going to happen. And you need to be aware that that is going to happen. And that should be documented of like, hey, this is going to block your whole program. You should be aware of this. Um, if we're writing service <coughs> functions, we should also provide those same constraints. And they're like, if you call this function, this is happening on another computer somewhere across the other side of the world. You should probably know about that. You know? And as long as that's documented, then we can provide these simple interfaces and just be aware that it might not work. You know? <laughs> That's it. Then let's get one more big round of applause for Ben, please.